Just ahead on Black Issues Forum, a decision on redistricting maps satisfies some, but not everyone's happy. What it takes to run for public office and a video showing police racial violence goes viral. Stay with us. Welcome to Black Issues Forum. I'm Deborah Holt Noel. This week, decisions on the state's redistricting maps were handed down, and now the way is clear for any candidate wishing to run for office in the upcoming May primary. They have until March 4th to file. On Thursday, a North Carolina trial court issued an order approving the North Carolina House, Senate, and congressional maps, and the North Carolina Supreme Court denied all appeals to the trial court's order. The head of the National Democratic Redistricting Districting Committee tweeted, quote, 10 years ago, Republicans in North Carolina and Pennsylvania drew gerrymandered maps that locked themselves into power. They tried again, but they were ready. We were ready. Now the voters in North Carolina and Pennsylvania have fair congressional maps where they get to decide the outcome of the elections. It's a big day, end quote. But in a press statement, Republican House Speaker Tim Moore said, quote, Today's ruling is nothing short of egregious, end quote. Currently, Republicans hold eight of the state's 13 U.S. House seats and will gain a 14th seat now that the census has been counted. Let's check in with this week's panel to get their take. I'd like to welcome House Democratic leader Robert Reeves of, of District 54, Chatham and Durham counties, Senator Natalie Murdoch of District 20, Durham, and Lamisha Whittington of Advance Carolina. So pleased to have all three of you here. Representative Weaves, you wrote an editorial about district maps uh, that appeared in the Chatham News record this week. Can you summarize where we are with all three maps and your thoughts about the balance of political power? Well, and, and I appreciate that and appreciate the opportunity to be here. With the maps, you had three sets of maps that were going up. You had congressional maps, state senate maps, state house maps. The state house maps, after the court ruled that they were a partisan gerrymander, came back. And all three of them, we had a chance to try to negotiate. We were able to successfully negotiate maps for the state house. The state senate was not able to successfully negotiate a set of maps. And so, therefore, those votes were on partisan lines, just as the congressional maps, which uh, did not seem to have any input from Democrats. So how do you think that leaves us with regard to a balance of party power right now? Well, right now, there's still an in, inordinate uh, shift towards Republicans when it really comes down to it. The, the state House maps, I feel, are much fairer than what we had. There's no issues about that. The state Senate maps, unfortunately, I, I don't think they're much different than the ones that were ruled an unfair partisan gerrymander in the first place. And I, um, and I was a little surprised that those held up. The congressional maps are obviously better than the 10-4 maps we were presented with. Uh, they still present challenges, that, but at least they do present opportunities in a couple of more districts that we didn't have. And there had to be some collaboration or at least some cooperation in getting that uh, first map done. T talk about your role in that. Well, it was uh, it was it was really just sitting down and and negotiating. We went for two straight weeks uh, where I, my chief of staff, and the um, House leadership uh, met each day. Um, it, it, many of you know that we kept up with it. We kept ours in an open room so that people could come in and comment or do whatever it is that they wanted to do. But uh, it was a lot of negotiation that lasted really up until not only the day but the hour that we uh, presented the maps and put those up for a vote. But in fairness, I think the House Republican leadership was really uh, invested in getting a decision that we could live with and with a uh, bipartisan vote. And um, I appreciated that, and that helped us get it. And I appreciate the support of our caucus, the Democratic caucus, because we didn't know what we needed to do. You know, some people initially thought maybe we should wait on the courts. Uh, some thought we maybe should negotiate and see what we could get. And, and the good thing is that everybody was in support of trying to work out a deal that was the best thing for North Carolinians. Thank you. Senator Murdoch, what are your mm -hmm. thoughts on the redistricting maps as they stand right now and how all of this has impacted delays for filing? <clears throat> 
Yes, um, as Leader Reeves mentioned, first and foremost, hats off to him. I am sad to lose him in the Durham delegation, but have had the honor of um, working with him um, these last few years. And as he mentioned in the House, they were successful in negotiating. They really came to the table. Unfortunately, in the Senate, that never happened. Um, we did propose um, some alter alternatives that we thought were more fair and, quite frankly, more reflective of the people of North Carolina, more diversity that would bring, you know, more fairness to these maps so that both sides have a chance. These maps should be competitive. You should be able to be challenged of getting your voters out, getting that message out. The issue of gerrymandering is it makes that pretty much impossible. And in the Senate, um, it will be difficult. We still will be fighting on my side to um, bring at least 22 senators back. Um, but we did not get maps that are fair and reflective of the diversity of our great state. We were hoping that the state Supreme Court would intervene. Unfortunately, they did not. Filing has opened. Um, so we're going to fight. We're going to fight until November. Thank you. L.A., wh what is your impression on where we are as, as the maps stand right now? How close are we to having uh, that representative electorate? So to echo, you know, the previous statements and comments have already been made in the leadership of um, Representative Reeves and Senator Murdoch, it's really plain and simple. Just because it's partisan fair doesn't mean it's racially fair. Um, oftentimes there's this assumption that our, uh, you know, black communities are monolithic. Um, and even though we know there's a close alignment between political party affiliation and race, as data uh, denotes very clearly, it, it, when we talk about gerrymandering there are actually, or in redistricting, there are actually really specific rules. Um, when you're drawing maps in the General Assembly as the elected leaders, they have to conduct what is called racially polarized voting analysis and being able to look at the black and brown population, how many of us live in a district, and to make sure that we are drawn in a way that amplifies our voting power if we're not the majority in that district, but we still deserve representation. That analysis really wasn't conducted in the construction of these maps. When we talk about the congressional maps that Representative Reeves already said was uh, uh, knocked down the first time, and then even the second time, guess what? It was because of this lack of analysis. And so when we talk about uh, the powers that be, Many of us as advocates have uh, supported what Representative Reeves uh, elevated in your recent thank you op-ed about an independent redistricting commission or an independent structure, because how can you trust a body of leaders that have already proven time and time again that they are willing to gerrymander the, our communities in a really clear way? How can we expect them to uh, rectify what they've done? It's almost policing themselves, and it's really hasn't been statistically proven to be uh, successful. And so again, Partisan doesn't mean racially fair. Great point. You know, uh, Representative Reeves, talk a little bit more about um, your support or your interest in having a neutral body to draw these lines. Who would that well, be? And, and just as L.A. said, it, it's really funny. Uh, there's no other area in any government and any law where we have the people who are being policed police themselves. And I thought that was a great analogy that she used there. Because what you're doing is this, you're making the person who's trying to draw these maps do two things that are against human nature. Number one, you're having to tell them that you should do what's best for the other people, not what's best for you. And of course, a lot of people that run up for office, they think, well, the best thing for my district is for me to stay there <laughs> instead of thinking of what fairly represents the district. And then beyond that, if you can get that person to go beyond their own human interests, now you're asking them to trust in our house 119 other people to do the same thing. And the problem is, is that you really get lulled into where you've got to play by the rules that are presented. An independent commission doesn't cause this problem. Detractors of independent commissions will initially say, well, everybody's political. And the truth is, I think all of us on this panel know, that's a small bubble that lives their lives for the political game. Most people want to see what's best for their communities. I think if you go talk about, talk to the, woman on the street, the first thing that you'll notice is, you know, there are only a few people who actually know who the representatives are, that type of thing. So why not get an independent commission? The only argument for gerrymandering is if you're in power to say, well, everybody before me got to do it, I ought to get to do it. And that's not a good argument. Well, the couldn't truth you is, have... what we have, we should be able to do it. Yes, ma'am. Senator, let me get let me get Senator Murdoch in here. We've got about 60 seconds for this <laughs> block, but, you know, couldn't we just have enough rules that it doesn't matter who is making the decisions, as long as you're following the rules, everything is clean. Absolutely. I think there definitely is a way, and we have so many models nationwide where folks have gotten it right, they're doing a better job. Um, as the other panelists mentioned, it is 
quite frankly, impossible for us to do this. I do not want to do it. I want us to figure out a way um, to do it fairly. We can do that. I think an independent redistricting commission is the way to go. You cannot have those that are so deeply invested in the results of these maps to be the ones drawing those maps. And But unfortunately, the reality is we are stuck with this system right now. I do not have confidence in current leadership to change our system. The only way to do that is to elect new leaders. Well, we're going to be talking about representation. And I want to talk about political representation because when it comes to black voters, we hear time and again the importance of getting more African Americans to hold these political seats. Before that can happen, they have to run for office. I'd like to bring in Michael Stewart Isaacs, co-founder of I Am Brilliant, political and social justice think tank. Michael, thank you so much for being here. Let thank me you. just ask you, when it comes to representation, how do you believe the, the community feels in terms of being represented and about the possibility of actually running for office in order to fill some of these seats? Well, again, thank you, Deborah, for having me here, and thank you. Um, I'm happy to be here during the Black History Month, um, particularly when you look at the representation of uh, our communities as well as for our young people. A lot of times there's a cultural shift going on, obviously, and young people do not sometimes see themselves in the political place because sometimes we as a society tend to keep young people in their consistent state of being a kid and a child. And what young people nowadays, because they're informed with information, they're trying to find direction. And I think as we look at political leaders such as Senator Murdoch and some of the others that are younger that are showing people a new way, I think that people are hopeful that there's opportunities for great leadership and they believe they are ready to step up. They just don't quite understand the process and they're still at the point where they don't understand how voting as well as participating actually affects them in their day-to-day -day life. So I think there's a disconnect that we have to f address and bridge the gaps of understanding. Definitely a need to educate folks. Even um, in the elementary high school level, there's just not enough information about how our political system works. And Senator Murdoch, you're a great leader, an example for, for young people in that you've run. Can you share a little bit about what it takes to run for office? Yes, um, it takes a lot to run, and I'm actually going to um, take a phrase from my colleague in the Senate, Senator Woodard. You need to have the three Fs. You need to have faith, family, and finances. You need to consult with your family. They will have to be with you on this journey. You cannot do it alone. Um, finances, um, the other guest uh, point about being young, um, it is hard to do. Um, in the General Assembly, we make $13,900 a year. If I was not a consultant and had my own business and another way to make make money and have a flexible schedule, I couldn't do it. And um, faith, um, you really have to know your why. You have to know why you're running. It is very hard. It will be very difficult. It will be very taxing and challenging. And so you have to be doing it for the right reasons. That is what makes you get up every day and and join, you know, this this battle uh, as we continue to fight for, for our state um, and also the will to do it. You have to be focused on your race and, and why you're running and just jump out there and, and do it. Representative Reeves, you know, I think a lot of people might be okay with faith and friends, but when it comes to the finance, that's where they say, I'm out. <laughs> so, I mean, and then it's not fair because, you know, then the people who are representing us just so happen to be people who um, have wealth. What does it, what does it take? Yeah, How do you get around right. that or do you? Well, you, what you have to do is then that's when you have to depend on a system. And, and that's why your why is so important. Mm -hmm. Figure out what you're running for and why you're running for it. And then I, I think the finances will come because you can then try to figure it out from the system. Barack Obama was able to be uh, one of the most successful presidential campaigns we know with five, ten, and twenty-five dollar donations. Yes. And so I think it's uh, definitely something you can accomplish. But it's very important to do you know your why, and it's very important to educate yourself on what the different parts of government are because that's to me the biggest disconnect that we have as michael was talking about that people just don't know what government is and what mm -hmm. roles different parts serve mm -hmm. and in some ways you know la i look at representation and it seems like we had greater i would say we african americans had greater representation back during a previous decade than we have even today even though we're supposed to be making and have made so much progress. What is your understanding? Uh, that's a great point, Deb. And so first, before I answer that question, I do want to note for listeners that primary, our primary is scheduled for May 17th. 
and a potential second primary for July 5th or July 26th. So that are part of the historic strategy and election is also knowing when the dates are because everything has been moving. Everything's been in yes. flux. So document those dates. That's yes. one. Thank um, you. Two to back up to the history, right? Here's the reality that we're looking at. The redistricting and the gerrymandering that has been taking place uh, in drawing these maps last year and what's been struck down this year has been an orchestrated attack against black elected officials. It is tied to actually dilute and remove black elected officials from their districts. And the best and most precise way to do that is to dilute black voting power. We saw that historically in the Reconstruction era of the 1870s when black communities who were newly emancipated created black towns and accumulated over 15 million acres of land and elected from that 187 black elected officials in North Carolina, including four congressional members. In contrast today, we have two. So when you're talking about the inequities, there was an attack on that ascension of power in the 1870s. And that is when the first racial gerrymanders began in eastern North Carolina, when the powers that be gerrymandered and called it the Black Second, where they packed black voters in, diluted their power and removed those black elected officials. Mm -hmm. We're seeing the exact same thing. The two, one of our two congressional members, Congressman Butterfield, uh, has already elevated that this is an alarm, a five alarm fire, that he is retiring next year after Republicans removed Pitt County, which is about 35 percent uh, black from his district. The last thing is the number of black legislators in the original maps, again, that has been struck down, but we have to be very clear what was just struck down. Black legislators are being drawn out of their districts, yes. and it has outpaced any recent redistricting cycles. Yes. This has impacted local, county, city council. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. black commissioners, all the way up to the black state and federal level. It is very orchestrated, and it is a trend that is happening nationally. So we have to be very clear. This isn't the first time in history. It's because of the ascension of power that we are accumulating. These are strategic attacks, and you do that by diluting the black voting power. Mm -hmm. And the rural population, while our rural populations in the state has decreased, it has increased and black and brown population, which means this is becoming a plantation politic. More black and brown folks in rural areas, which make up 80% of the state, but we have more white elected officials at a higher probability of being in office that black voters did not vote in due to gerrymandering. That's the real threat. Mm -hmm. Well, it's important to people for people to also understand that the voting also includes judges. And as of uh, the recording of this program, President Biden has announced his yeah. pick for Supreme Court Justice. Her yeah. name is Katanji Brown Jackson, D.C. Mm -hmm. Appellate Court Judge, <laughs> and we congratulate her for, on that nomination. Senator yes. Murdoch, what are your thoughts? I am elated. Um, I am a proud member of Win with Black Women, and we started a national campaign, honestly, during the Obama era, um, to get um, a black woman on the U.S. Supreme Court, and just thrilled and elated to get this news. This morning, history will be made. She will be confirmed. Um, and I also want to preface everything that's going to go on with her confirmation that she is beyond qualified. So I don't want to hear anything about her qualification. She is a double Ivy undergrad and law school degree from Harvard, um, was already approved, um, is already a member of the federal court system, beyond qualified. And, and just you need to see this level of diversity on the highest court of the land. And, you know, black women, we are leaders. You know, we, we have a right to be seen at every level of government, including the highest court of the land. So uh, with all of the heaviness that we've been dealing with this week um, globally, I'm just thrilled that we can have a moment on this Friday um, to celebrate and, quite frankly, to honor um, that President Biden fulfilled his campaign promise as well. I think we need to acknowledge him for that. Absolutely. And I would love to get everyone else's uh, thoughts on this. Maybe just a 30-second, Michael, reaction. Uh well, I'm just happy to hear about the announcement. I think it's uh, well overdue, I believe. As most of us know, black women have been the ones that hold us down over the last few years in terms of political representation, as well as just having a solid voice. And so with what she can bring to the bench will allow for us to finally have issues that affect us Take, being taken at a higher level of consideration. So I'm on, I think it's well time to end Black History Month as well as start Women's History Month with such a historic yes. opportunity. So I'm grateful that we have this opportunity to be better taken care of as a country by a black woman. Absolutely. And right now I'm going to thank Representative Robert Reeves for joining us. I know you have to duck out, thank but you. we appreciate you being here. And thank you so much for joining Black Issues Forum. Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful. 
A video depicting police racial bias in action went viral last week after police were called to break up an altercation between two teenagers at a shopping mall in Bridgeport, New Jersey. Yo, it says he's black. Racially motivated. It was later revealed that the taller 15-year-old was not white, but told reporters that his mother is Colombian and his father is Pakistani. The younger boy was 14 and reportedly was trying to defend his friend, a seventh grader, in the incident. Senator Murdoch, you see this video, and what did you think? Just really heartbreaking, um, and as you laid it out, it just really, really shows that implicit bias, racial bias is very, it's real. And that is why we have to talk about these issues when we try to shy away from it. These things will continue to happen when you look at training in law enforcement. I spent some time at the Department of Justice, and when we, you know, train law enforcement to go into diverse communities, they have to know what they're walking into, and you cannot jump into a situation and treat someone differently simply because they're black. This is is exactly what happened and it's on film uh, you know unfortunately we saw you know the same with George Floyd the revolution will be televised and I'm just thankful that we have this cell phone footage because we will continue to show this footage unfortunately it will not be the last incident but when you see it um, in black and white it does at least allow us to move forward with proceedings from an administrative perspective or in a court of law so that we hopefully will continue to shed a light on these issues and these incidents when folks want to simply explain them away um, but you cannot justify why these two young men were treated so very very differently. You cannot justify that. And, and what kills me every time is that we continue to plead the case. It's as though there's this fact that exists. And every time something like this comes around, it's like, well, now, now see, here's a perfect example of it. L.A., what are your thoughts? I mean, can uh, we have to, legislation to try to control this? Right. So you, you really read my mind. <laughs> I knew I was about to go to the policy, right? So first, it's hopeful to see this generation, this emerging generation that is in this a state of advocacy for themselves. Even if there was a, you know, a, a, we've seen an adolescent uh, opportunity where there's arguments happening, bullying that's happening. These are natural adolescent right engagement. And to see uh, youth have to be activated almost as adults with a logical comprehension to say, well, wait a minute, this isn't fair. That advocacy is admirable, but it shouldn't be an honest that is placed on the shoulders of those teens to regulate police action. And so to that point, we have to have regulation and enforcement. And so last year, what we saw, uh, even in North Carolina, was the hope of uh, a, a database that would collect examples of uh, use of force, injury, and fatality by law enforcement. But then there was a provision that was hidden within the state budget that actually restricts and forbids law enforcement and sheriff's offices from even publicizing and detailing those very incidences that we fought for. Most of the public doesn't know that. And so now law enforcement in North Carolina, their hands are tied. Even if they wanted to make it public, the General Assembly made it ineffective and prohibited that, that, uh, that event. So here's that issue, right? What is the enforcement that has been snuck in provisions that we're not aware of? The FBI uh, has a use of force data collection, but it's self-reported data. You can't trust, again, uh, agencies to go against their own best self-interest. And because of that, there hasn't been enough reports, and that database actually might be shut down as a program because the FBI hasn't received enough self-report data. And so we, we need social media to sit at a Murdoch's point because that's our database. Absolutely. And we just talked about self-reporting. Michael, your thoughts? Well, I'm going to take a different take on this because I'm as a father... I first see, you know, this is just heartbreaking. You know, I have teenage children, um, two teenage boys, and just thinking about them, if this was them, right? And you always prepare your children. As black people, we always have to prepare our children for the possibility that this could be the outcome. Most of the times, our kids, because 
of their lack of maturity. They don't understand that this can happen to them. They think it can't happen to them, no different than those kids being in the mall fighting. They didn't think they went there to start a fight. I think that when you look at this in perspective, you had a young kid defending another young kid, trying to help him out, and sometimes that goes too far. Really what I want to bring this to is when we look at culture and we look at policing, sometimes we have to understand a lot of these police officers are young. And so I, not only are they inadequately trained, they also have been trained by their own pop cultural influences, whether that's video games and other things that allow for them to lose the sense of empathy and believe shoot first is the policy, to bring violence and force is the policy. But then I also have to shift it to our young people, especially having young kids. Some of the music and some of the things we see in culture are driving these negative narratives that some, unfortunately, they become the commercial that police officers and people of other cultures only see our community as. They see us as the, the tough guy, gang person. They see us as the, the drill rapper. And so when they see us in these discerning moments, we have to go deeper and understand that we have a cultural, social issue of the lens and what we see and what perception is that keeps causing these constant instances. And, and to, that is a... I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, mm. but we have come to the end. Great point. Michael Stewart Isaacs, thank you so much, as well as L.A. Whittington and Senator Natalie Murdoch. We appreciate you. I want to thank today's guests for joining us today. We invite you to engage with us on Twitter or Instagram using the hashtag Black Issues Forum. You can also find all of our full episodes on pbsnc.org slash Black Issues Forum or listen at any time on Apple iTunes, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. For Black Issues Forum, I'm Deborah Holt Noel. Thanks for watching. through the financial contributions of viewers like you who invite you to join them in supporting PBSNC.